What's going on everybody? Gunner here, and I am repeating my intro because my intro turned into a really long discussion that I'm going to put at the end of this. So, what we're going to tie today is the Swung Fuzz. So this is the third installment to this whole uh, Strong Fuzzy Fiber series of flies. And what I'm trying to show you guys is variations. So we have the Fuzz Junior, we have the Fuzz Senior, which is going to come after this one. We have the Hot Fuzz, the articulated version, now this is the Swung Fuzz. And every single one of these bugs, same, uh, basically you have to understand the same design, same style, same um, almost like silhouette proportions hydraulics it's all based off the same principles but tied in different variations to match different forage match different sizes right so what we're coming in today is a wiggle tail swing sculpin now, i've been working on wiggle tail swing flies for like four or five months now this is finally the version i'm super happy with awesome profile just big fat head wide peck fins a uh, perfect amount of weight to be swung on a floating line and watch the end of the video if you want to know more, because I'll go into greater depth of that. So, to start off this bug, I'm tying it first of all in a different color combo because I don't have any more of these red tails. And so, yeah. And these aren't gonna be on the website immediately. Check back in like uh, two weeks or something because I gotta get some more small tails. But, this is a Paolo, and I'm gonna butcher the last name, sorry Paolo, Parcherini, Something like that. Size small. The size small is like perfect. Extra small is kind of nice. Um, and it's small enough that it won't really deaden the retrieve. You can get a pretty good snap jig out of these flies with these small tails. So this is small holographic silver. I have in the vise a size uh, 5 millimeter, 10 millimeter, the smallest size regardless. Uh, Flyman Fishing Company Fish Spine. And I'm coming in with monofilament tying thread because it's going to be clear. You can use white if you want or whatever thread matches the color combo that you decide to tie these in. Um, but if you need these wiggle tails, check out the Nightmare Musky Flies. I don't know if you'll have these sizes. Um, you can also check out, oh forgive me Benny, um, Raypex Fly Fishing out in Toronto. Both of those guys have wiggle tails uh, here in the North American region that you can check out. But I tie these in backwards and I clipped my fingernails yesterday which was not helpful. But there, you pin that to the side. You can see I'm tying this in uh, backwards so the tail's like facing my bobbin hand. And you just wrap that right tight to the, the flyman eye, the eye of the shank, and that'll stop that from being able to slip off and gives that a nice fat base. And I like these, I'm doing a, a permanent wiggle tail. I don't really play with the snaps on these smaller sizes or like the catnips or wiggle tail eye candies. I like to just do a permanent tail. Um, it'll last basically the life of the bug, which is probably, you know, 30, 40 fish or something like that before you gotta replace the fly, but they're not super hard to tie, so no worries there. And then I just hit that with super glue. And so this fly is going to be tied in a swing style, meaning it's going to be on a shank with an extended hook, um, basically because it's a long bodied fly, right, and we're presenting this tail first to a fish, so we're going to get up more tail grabs, and it's, it's not so far back that you're going to miss head eats by a, a big large predatory trout, but you're going to get a lot of tail grabs, tail nippers, and we're using a 3D bead for our hot spot uh, to, to kind of enhance where that eat is going to happen. And so by extending it back uh, with wire, there's wire in here, that hook is able to move and rotate and articulate freely around that shank so a fish can't get leverage over a long shank hook and spit the hook. So that's why we're doing it that way. And when I talk about swinging, if you stay till the end, you'll see what I mean because I have a very specific retrieve in mind, although you can do whatever you want. But I fish it very specifically for a very specific time of year and purpose. But in the vise, I have an Arex Predator trailer hook. This is a size one. It has a barb. I'd recommend pinching them, but you can do whatever you like. It's pretty big, hefty hook. I don't think very many people would go this big, um, but I'm fishing it a lot for smallmouth bass and such. Now I really like the bend on these Predator trailers and it's actually offset. The hook point and the shank are offset from each other if you can see that, which is pretty nice. If you are going to tie this without the tail, still a super fishy bug, I'd recommend the A-Rex, it's a, the A-Rex 
trailer hook. Size six is just about perfect. That's much more trout appropriate if you're doing this without the tail. Um, the thing, the reason why I'm not using them is the bend is a little bit more, I would say graceful, elongated. And so it makes this articulating the tail backwards a little bit trickier. You need a little bit more spacing, a little bit stiffer wire. Um, and these Predator trailer hooks are, are perfect. So I'm, before I get ahead of myself here, I like to run my tails down because no matter what position I like to run them down, just because that's a lot of mass right here. If you think about the mass of the tail physically running in line, it's going to want to rest in a tail down position. This stops it from following. Now, obviously when your hook point and your tail are in the same orientation, there's a greater tendency for following. So that's kind of contradictory, but it's, it's also not really. Um, so we're gonna do two beads for spacing. I need to run this loop vertical. So I have my wire pinned on the side here. And this is Greg Senyo's uh, Predator trailing wire, what's it called? Standard intruder trailer hook wire for size six and larger. So this is basically like 0 .018 diameter nylon coated stainless steel. Um, and you can use that instead, but this is pretty good stuff. So I'm gonna use it. And then I'm gonna come in with my 3D bead uh, closest to the hook in a contrasting color. I'm gonna add a small glass bead. By the way, the 3D beads, these are about six millimeters. You can just use a six millimeter plastic bead if you're at a craft store. That's an appropriate substitute. Then I'm gonna come in with a small glass bead, whatever that is, maybe two millimeters. Thread this up through my tail. Try not to get any twist in that thing. Pin that to the side, then I can twist my wire here back that off two turns twist my wire and make sure my loop is perfectly vertical add some tension to that and then wrap that back so now I have this nice extension it's going to reduce following it's going to appropriately space that tail backwards so that it won't want to follow it's going to stiffen that joint up the beads are going to stiffen that wire up and then that yellow contrasting bead I'm going to be tying this in a white uh, for smallies but that white or that yellow 3D bead is going to contrast really well with the overall pattern to help target the strikes right at the base of this hook. Then we're going to super glue all of this goodness. So this pattern is mostly rigging. It's all about setting up this tail, setting up this back hook, getting this back hook on the on the 25 millimeter Flyman Fishing Company Greg Senyo steelhead salmon articulated shank. That was a mouthful, but I'll say it again. <laughs> and I'll put a, there's a link, not a link, but a, a material list in the description for all this good stuff. But that's our, our hook. That's our rear hook. That's our tail. And again, I'm going to run this hook down with the intention of swinging this above the fish's head. So anytime I fish a, a swing fly kind of above a fish's head, hook down. Anytime you're below fish, if you are going to choose to dredge it, which I don't really do very often, but if you are going to dredge it, then you can run a hook up and I'd run that tail hook down, hoop down, whatever you want to say. But you know what I'm saying. So that's what we got going on so far. Now we're going to come in. This is the 25 millimeter it's a Flyman Fishing Company shank. It's the Greg Senyo design for basically intruders and steelhead flies. You can see that. Sorry, that doesn't look very good against my black t-shirt. But there you go. Uh, we'll just tie it in red because we can. I get really lazy and I leave red thread on this bobbin and I like it and then I forget that it's on there and then I don't do it for orders but for my personal stuff it's kind of just like whatever. But something that we're going to do. So we're going to attach size large, size large lead eyes. That's pretty heavy. You can use large brass eyes. Actually, I prefer those, but I don't have any in stock yet. I'm trying to, I'm working on that. But this is for myself, so I'm not worried about it. But the size large lead eye is phenomenal for doing a floating line wiggle tail presentation. And we're going to pin that basically right to the hook eye because we're not going to run any materials in front of this. So this is like super intruder-ish, I think. I don't really know, I've never tied an intruder, but it's very intruder-ish. <laughs> and what's really nice about these Flyman shanks, right? They, the, the wire, uh, the wire's doubled back in the back right here, which is gonna help us pin our wire 
uh, directly in the center of this to go rearward and it's also doubled back up here under the front which helps your lead eyes sit perfectly level. I'm gonna zoom in a bit here and I hope that didn't get out of focus a little bit but that looks pretty good in here. I'll, I'll, re, I'll see if I can refocus that. There you go. But you can see how that, that lead eyes on that double wire and it sits back perfectly and we have the double wire right here so our, our wire sits perfectly. So super really convenient to do lead eyed shanked flies. Ooh. I wasn't really paying attention there. Shredded my thread. Don't mind all that. It's gonna be okay. Don't worry. <laughs> so again, we're coming in with the, the standard uh, intruder trailer hook wire from Greg Senyo, this guy right here. Um, and I'm going to walk that through my hook. I'm gonna tie this whole fly with the hook on because my spacing is a little short and stiff to be able to remove the hook. So I basically just thread it like that. I like to leave it a little bit loose. It sits uh, more appropriately if you leave it, if you leave the wire a little bit loose on that hook eye. Then you can pop that wire down either side of that shank, throw a loose thread wrap on there and get your spacing uh, perfect, which is about right there because I want it just free enough to be able to articulate so fish can't get leverage. And again, that's one of those things why the wiggle tail is permanent is really the fly is not designed so that you can uh, replace those hooks because it's it's almost tied too close to the shank. But I wanted the fly to be small enough and appropriate enough that um, fish kind of get hooked no matter where they eat the fly because that hook is kind of like right in the dead center of the body with regards to where that wiggle tail is. And then I run these tag ends up through this hook eye, shank eye. I'm gonna pull that back basically as hard as I can here and trap those down to the best of my abilities. And that's so none of that can get pulled out. Cause I got some pretty hefty smallies that tackle this nonsense. Then we're going to come in, hit this with some super glue, and we'll actually start right tying as soon as we get this glue on here. So we're going to come in, this is almost identical um, to a Fuzz Junior, with the exception that the tail is an ostrich, but the tail is a wiggle tail. That's about it. It's about the only difference. And so we're going to come in, we have an EP Foxy Brush 3 inch wide and an EP Sparkle Brush in Holographic Silver. We're going to run these simultaneously up this hook shank up this shank shank, <laughs> this uh, steelhead shank, basically just middle of the body here. So we're going to try to go for about four turns, get it nice and dense, kind of allow that to push some water and it's going to flare our ostrich wing here. And then because we're going for a sculpin, um, unlike the fuzz junior, which is more of a bait fish pattern, I'm actually going to put some uh, some, uh, what is it, hen, basically a hen saddle feathers on here for pectoral fin imitations. Well, that was one, two, three, four. I'm going for a fifth because I'm feeling lucky. Got five turns on there. Clean away our material so we're catching straight on that wire. That way we have a nice secure hold on this wire. We'll put two turns down two turns in front. So you gotta be a little careful with that hook on there, uh, mostly when you're stroking your fibers back. That's really where it's gonna come into play. And then you leave little tag ends of wire right there to tie in twice, which is ideal because that's kind of gonna be our base to attach our ostrich ring right now and those um, the hen feathers. So I'm gonna come in with that barred ostrich plumes that have kind of been featured in all of these fuzz videos. It's gonna be the grizzly, the white and black barred ostrich. Super fishy, I absolutely love this stuff. It's just phenomenal. So you can see how that brush, it builds a nice, fat, flashy teardrop Arctic Fox 
uh, core that covers all the way back to that hook. So that hook is not like being shown anywhere. It's all hidden uh, for the most part, going right back to that tail. And so we have this perfect, um, basically the core of this fly is two and a half inches. It's a pretty small bug, right? And so if you had a 20 inch trout, like this thing's gonna disappear like completely. But anyway, coming in. It's about six fibers. You don't need that many. Um, but we're gonna do about a six fiber wing here. I might double some of this stuff up. We'll see how long it is and what I have to work with here. So I'm gonna take these fibers. I like to put just a little bit of taper into them. And unlike all of my patterns thus far, <laughs> I am not gonna reverse tie these. I know, it's crazy. But it's because this head gets a little sloppy and we're gonna run strong fuzzy fiber up through all of this so it's all good. But that's all I'm looking for, right there. Just that barred, grizzly, dark tone, mottled, colored back is gonna get us our teardrop extended back taper. It goes right back to the base of that wiggle tail. I don't know if you can see that and back this out just a hair, but it goes back to the base of where that wiggle tail starts, which is absolutely perfect because it makes a very seamless uh, bug. Pull that stuff out of there. And then I'm gonna come in with some Grizzly Hen Saddles. So this is a Mets Hen Saddle in Grizzly number one. You guys can see that stuff, it's super nice product. Um, you get quite a lot of different sizes if you guys want something that's a little bit cheaper, check out this Grizzly Soft Hackle Patch. Put that in focus. Grizzly Soft Hackle Patch is huge. Absolutely ginormous. Um, the only reason why I'm not using it is because it's a lot, it has a lot of variation. Um, there's kind of some saddle style, like some hen uh, style feathers back here that you can use. There's some slopping style feathers. There's some like chickaboo style feathers. There's some like, weird dry fly hackles like it has like every hackle on it and every color has been a little bit different so it's it's a nice product but it's kind of I don't know it's got too much variance to use regularly I would say but I'm gonna come in and that's actually what's on that olive bug it's that grizzly soft hackle patch that's what this is but I'm gonna come in with the hen saddles and I don't want them to be super big but I want them to be about the third of the body which is gonna be a little tricky to tie in, and I'll show you why. Oh, got a little bit of the way on that one. But I'm just gonna mash these to the size I want. They're probably gonna give me some trouble tying them in. And I haven't worked out the best way to tie these in. They're really easy to tie in at near full length. A little bit harder when you tie them in shorter than this, but I'm gonna tie them so that they're concave out, so you can see how the feather falls away uh, from the fly that's trying to imitate that kind of pectoral fin. And I'm gonna hit that with a nice loose wrap. Give that some good tension, wrap that back, tie that in. That's holding nice and clean for me. Probably just got lucky. So these stems, the soft tackle from the hen, it's, it's, they're, I don't know, the stems are, man, that's really inconvenient. I think I got a loose part of the shank on that bottom there somewhere. But the hen stems are really thin. Um, so like if you were to take like, I don't know, slopping would be a poor example, but slopping stems are pretty pronounced. If you were to try to tie in like a slopping stem, it'd want to twist on you because that stem's compressed. But these, uh, the stem on that hen is, is really kind of supple and soft and is manipulatable um, so that you can kind of pin that sideways on that fly and get that, that profile to show up really well. So basically all we're going to do is going to fill up this dead space right here with strong fuzzy fiber and shape it into a very wide sculpting profile so that we have all this nice fat bulk behind this head to truly imitate a sculpting or some sort of bottom dweller, sucker, chub, whatever you want to do. Uh, dace, fat heads, any minnow species that's got a big old head, <laughs> anything of that nature. And so I, I just did a dubbing loop right here. If you don't know how to do, do a dubbing loop, I have a, a tutorial. It's more focused on predatory pike flies, but you can go check that out. Um, and then I'm going to come in with some cream. We're going to come in with a cream colored Hedron Flash Boot Strong Fuzzy Fiber, which 
is like the world's greatest stuff on earth. <laughs> you don't have to believe me, but you should because it's good. So this is this creamy colored strung fuzzy fiber right here. Um, and I'll throw a link in the description where you can get this stuff. Um, and I just I wanted that cream to add a little bit of yellowy belly texture up front and then I'm going to tone it with a chart pack marker when we get up to the top of the head. But I'm going to do this in the same style and proportions as the Fudge Junior. So right now I've quartered it. I've cut it in half and cut it in half again. What I'm going to do is I'm going to come in and cut this in perfectly 60-40. I'd say it's in uh, asymmetrical eighths, basically is how I would describe that. You don't have to use fancy words if you don't want to, but it's asymmetrical eighths. And then we're going to come in, hit this with some wax. That's always helpful. This stuff holds really, really, really well in a dubbing loop with some wax. It's an ultra durable head. And I'm going to come in long fibers first, short fibers second, building a kind of a teardrop bullet here. The fibers closest to the shank, I'm going to run 60-40. The fibers closer to me, 50-50. Once I get to the short fibers, I'm going to run those 60-40. As they get closer to me, 50-50. So the whole head, as you spin this up and wrap it forward, basically is one massive, perfectly tapered teardrop. It's the whole point. That way, you basically don't have to trim it if you don't want to. I probably do because, I don't know, I'm a neat freak and I want it to look exactly the way I want it to look. But you don't have to worry about it. If you do the, the dubbing loop correctly, it'll spin up just perfectly for you. Then I comb that out pretty aggressively. You can use a bodkin here if you don't have a, a, a comb, but this is like a 99 cents Walmart special, which I've had for six years now and I haven't even lost a single bristle. The cone is the bomb. Spin that up. That's perfect right there. I just My dubbing loop just started to shrink on me. I could feel that get pulled in. Kind of reach the elastic limit of my loop here. I'm going to draw these off all to the same side. And because this is a swing fly, um, and it's, I want that push of water to be pretty severe and it's not really intended to be jerk stripped, although it can be snap jigged. Um, this, is, this head is quite a bit denser than a Fuzz Junior. And you have to understand that Fuzz Junior is weightless. That Fuzz Junior has nothing, this has size large uh, lead eyes. So there's quite a bit of difference in the momentum to these flies. There's quite a bit of difference in, in how bulky this head needs to be. So on these swing patterns, right, which are under constant water pressure, um, the kind of bigger push of water you can get away with, the more effective that pattern is going to be at getting attention, at animating that ostrich hurl, at animating um, all of that EP Foxy brush will just breathe to it if you have a, a, a nice push of water at this head. And the beauty of the, the strong fuzzy fiber is it doesn't trap water and it doesn't absorb water and it doesn't hold water. So you can build these super bulky heads that really doesn't, they don't have a negative consequence to them. There's nothing unfriendly about trying to cast that, except obviously large lead eyes aren't super, super friendly to cast, but if you stay till the end, you'll see that I'm not, you know, bombing this 70 feet or trying to use, you know, some two hand rods or anything like that. This is designed to be really a, a pretty close up. Not exactly sure what just happened, but my camera just turned off for a second. So hopefully I didn't lose much, but I'm flattening this belly, right? Getting a nice wide scalp and taper profile to this bug. I want this head to push an insane amount of water. And I was talking about, I don't know why I got on this subject, but I was talking about why I like smaller flies, believe it or not. And how, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know where I was going with that other than I actually do. If you look at basically all of my patterns, all my trout bugs are in this kind of three and a half to five inch window. Like they are not that big. I'm coming in with about eight, 10 plumes of ostrich or peacock. My apologies, peacock. But um, it's like that three and a half to really five and a half inch range is just this super prime trout range. And um, 
yeah, like all my pike bugs are basically five, uh, five, I don't know where I was going with five, but they're all like six and a half to eight and a half inches. And all my musky flies are like seven to 10 inches. And yeah, I have a 12 inch pattern and maybe it, you can stretch that um, to get maybe 12 and a half out of it, 13 inches. But it's like, I, I love these, I don't know where I'm just going with all this. I'm just going to stop talking. Maybe I'll, I lost my train of thought completely, but <laughs> whatever. Small bugs. There's something about this, this prime range of forage that is just, it's prime. 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 Fish eat other fish. Get over it. But anyway, coming in. We got peacock. I'm going to whip finish right here behind this head. Maybe it's good that all that's red, maybe it's not. And then I'm going to come in, curl this to match my back. Basically that is the swung fuzz. I don't really mess with this head at all. Kind of just leave it uh, a little nasty like that, all that thread up there. But that's the perfect, uh, you get this perfect teardrop silhouette with all that strong fuzzy fiber, ton of water push, um, but truly an appropriately sized volume. That's where I was going with all that stuff. Truly an appropriate volume to mimic a sculpin. You know, I, I think people, that's where I was going, I remembered. People always, you know, they, they kind of diss the big, the big fly scene, which is totally cool because I don't think you need a nine and a half inch fly to target brown trout. Like you don't, you can get away with a four inch fly. It's all about where you put that fly and how you swim that fly. But what you have to understand is people, when they're fishing a three inch fly, that fly is not mimicking a three inch fish. They're so skinny and scrawny and thin. Like a three inch sculpin is meaty. A three inch sculpin still has a beefy head to it and beefy pectorals. Like even if you only fish a two inch bug, make sure that that is a, an appropriate two inch bug that matches the volume of a two inch fish. Like it's all about, you gotta match the hatch. It's not just about matching the color or the action, but match the volume. And so many flies, like you look at hollow points and jerk juniors, you look at sculpt yaddies, like these are not big patterns. These are four inch patterns, four and a half inch patterns, you know, jerk juniors, three and a half inch patterns, but they match volume volume it's it's all about and you know a jerk junior's got a crazy big hook on it but that hook is important for the action but so many people i think they think you know big flies are crazy and some of them are but really if you're going to match if you're going to fish a small fly make sure you fish an appropriately small fly that isn't just small for the sake of being small but it's small to match small forage i don't know if that any of that makes sense but that's where i went with that anyway i like to come in to secure all this, kind of give it a little shiny uh, taper. My peacock's driving me crazy because it won't lay down exactly the way I want it to. Can't tell I tried to like curl that stuff like 10 times. But I'm gonna come in and use Deer Creek's Builder Resin, which is the old UV Diamond Fine, or uh, UV Diamond Thick. And it's just a, bee, a kind of like a beefy, uh, it's not as runny, nice tack free resin. And I'll basically just do the top and bottom at different times. Put a big old dab right on top. Mend that around this eye. Bring that down the sides of that fiber. And then cure that. You can see that cream head and I didn't know this before I started tying, but that cream head is fluorescent. You see all that? That's all beautiful stuff. Then we're going to tag the bottom, and that will be the swung fuzz. Sorry about that whole, <laughs> that whole side thing to big flies and small flies. I read an article this morning that was kind of dissing the big fly scene, which I completely agreed with. Um, I do think some most people have taken streamer design the wrong way and it's, it, it became how much material can you put on a hook instead of thinking about why it's on the hook and what you're trying to accomplish and what you're trying to match and how it's supposed to swim. And I think as long as you keep that in mind, you know, there's nothing wrong with fishing seven inch bugs, but understand the forage that you're matching and why you're 
trying to match that forge and the time of year that forge is around or the time of year that forge is that size. And for me, it all becomes, it's all about probability and it's all about, you know, you think about musky fishing and people always think about these big, you know, 12 inch flies or 14 inch flies and it's like, if your river's got, you know, a bunch of stunted six inch perch in it and they make up 80% of the forage in that system, those muskie are going to react to seven inch flies, seven inch perch colored flies. Like you don't have to go out there with a 16 inch sucker pattern. Like, you know, those suckers might be there, but those suckers might only make up 10% of that forage system. And so it's all about understanding your system, the forage, the density that the, those fish are present, because all of the density, that the, the forage fish density is what impacts basically a predator search image and what what predators look for because they're looking for an easy meal and if there's you know a higher proportion of easy perch to kill then they're going to be focused on killing perch because if they if they train themselves to look for perch then basically they're going to be more effective at finding perch and those perch are at a higher density and they become basically a, a easier target because of their abundance ratios sorry that was like super oddball conversation for a swung fuzz but that that right there is a swung fuzz ladies and gentlemen <laughs> uh, my goodness what happened that was crazy i don't know why i talked about all that stuff but this is a swung fuzz and so check it out thanks for watching sorry for all that goodness i'm gonna splice in here my old intro which we got talking about something else that was super long and whimsical and whatever but Check it out. Thanks for watching. Super slick swing fly. Appropriate volume. Appropriate volume for the size. It's important. Awesome fluorescent colors. Hot spot bead by the trigger point. Small wiggle tails. Small enough they don't uh, negatively impact the action of a snap jig. You know, something like that. Um, that super pushy head that holds no water. Peck fins. Contrast. Sleek. Simple. Simple. It's a simple bug. Aside from all the, the kind of rigging so that it swims correctly, it's a simple bug. So thanks for watching. Check out the intro. The old, the, the old intro. Check out the old intro. Before we get started, what I want you to understand is what I mean by swing fly. I don't view it as like a, you need a certain rod and certain line and a certain cast. Like who cares about all that? Basically, it's you throw it out. Per, uh, you know perpendicular to the to you on the bank or whatever and you cast it across it goes downstream like it's a, a constant tension style retrieve across and down you cast it across it goes down and the reason why that's so cool to me is a wiggle tail when you think about wiggle tails you think about what is the most appropriate retrieve for a wiggle tail and it's constant uh, retrieve a constant animation means that that tail is always moving right and so by pairing a wiggle tail on a swing fly that fly is always in the current it's always under tension that tail is always moving and with uh, the jig fly if, if you pull it into slower currents which is going to happen because the idea is you cast it out it swings into the bank and then you jig it up the bank real quick and when I'm talking swinging I might be fishing 20 feet of line like I'm not bombing this you know, 60 feet across the river fishing the far bank. This is a very uh, fine-tuned bug. I fished this out west when I was at Kelly's shop for dirty water, you know, runoff fish. They're holding tight to the bank. The water's super pushy. And, and really what happened was, sorry, we're going into story time real quick before we start this. What happened was is we went out west. My wife and I, we met up with two college friends. We tried to take them fishing, and they had never fly fished in their entire life. And I'm sitting there. I'm going to back this out here. We'll, we'll get some autofocus going on. I'll slouch back really far so that you can see me because I don't want to adjust the camera. But it's like, I'll focus this on my face. But I tried to tell my friends, teach my friends, like, you know, here I am fishing an eight weight, a triple sculpt daddy, six and a half inch fly. We're in full runoff, dirty water, uh, super bright conditions, which was absolutely horrible. And I'm like, you know, casting upstream, 20 feet of line, jerk strip retrieve, two feet from the bank, super quick. Uh, it takes a lot of coordination, a lot of muscle memory. And I realized that I can't expect them to know all this. Like, I can't expect them to go from zero to 100 and me giving them a five minute speech about how to throw big streamers for trophy trout. And so it was like, I had to adapt my own style 
to teach them. And I'd never, I don't really, I'd have never taught somebody how to fly fish, right? I, I like, I tie, I teach fly tying because I, I, I'm able to describe that to myself. So it's easy to describe to you, but I've never had to explain to somebody how to fly fish. So it was like, what am I supposed to do? So it's super easy to teach someone to throw it out, you know, 15 feet of line. You don't need to know how to cast. Basically, you just load the rod and kind of flick it out. It swings into the bank, strip, strip, strip. And those fish are right on that soft line pocket where the bank and the fast water kind of meet. And it's always the whole Madison's like three feet deep or two feet deep. So you have this kind of little bank drop boulder structure with a soft pocket. You can fish the banks basically for the entire dirty water season. And so basically, that's how this fly and the mic drop came about, is their swing specific flies, swinging being the presentation, fish, uh, casting across, letting it swing down under tension, and then jigging it two or three times up this bank, and then recast. And so that's what I mean, that's what I'm talking about in particular on how I fish this. This is not like, I, I suppose you could fish it for steelhead or bomb it across, wherever you want to do and do some fancy two-handed rod rolly thingamabobber but like I'm just talking about super simplistic 20 feet across swing it into the bank jig 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 rinse and repeat so that's what this fly is designed to do um, it's designed for a floating line maybe I'll put all, I'll put all this at the end of the video but um, it's designed for floating line that's why it has it's got a size large these are uh, uh, what are they? <laughs> Hairline just did like a year a new product for like the past year, but the double pupil eyes is what it is. But they got the double pupil uh, size large eyes, and that way you can get a real jig. You know, it's it's when that fast water, that floating line system is way easier to handle. It's way easier to wade fish with, and that lead eyes keeps that bug you know a foot or two under the surface. It's not about getting down deep. It's not about dredging these flies. I still want that presentation over their head and we have a hook down because we're going over the fish's head and I want it, you know, I want them on that seam line, bring that right over the head and twitch it twice in front of them looking like a sculpin. He got washed downstream, he got out of position, he got caught in that fast current, he's trying to come back in, maybe he's getting chased by something, boom, and they eat it. And because you're running it back upstream and you're presenting it tail first on the swing, that's why it's tied on the shank with the stinger hook. Yeah. You guys know what I'm saying. So, let's tie the bug.